before I start, I just want to say that some of you were here at the other presentation, and I'm going to recap a lot of that presentation first before I go into the second part for the benefit of the folks that were not here. I hope it's not um, too repetitive for you, and the images are still, still as nice, so it should be entertaining to you if you've been seen some of this before. But that's my firm. Um, I love to show this because I'm very, very proud of it. Um, we are a firm that was founded in 2000, 2001 with the goal of, of creating complete um, places. And I say that because there are not a lot of um, people in the architecture or the planning profession who really think about it from all the way from the mechanics of the finance, all the way through to the details of the architecture. And we really felt like somebody needed to be doing that. So since 2000, we've been doing um, We do community design, architectural design, civic architecture. But what we're really doing here is community design. And I say that not just as a physical thing, because I really don't think the majority of this is a physical thing. A lot of it is community design in the sense of a community coming together to design their future. As, um, as Kevin said, we're, we're uh, sponsored by Mass Development and with Campbell Orange, with the help from the FERCOG, um, and with thanks to the, the fire department and the expeditions. So why are we here? <coughs> We've been, we've been asked to come in and look at a very um, particular subset of the, of the, um, the Tender Warren, which is to say the downtown riverfront area. Um, you, I don't have to walk you through the dimensions of it, but you can see these, these borders represent what we define as our study area, and that's not a random study area. It includes the things that we, the area that we felt were critical to um, presenting uh, a well-rounded recommendation for how Orange can move forward. Um, just to locate you, there's the river running down the middle, north of Main Street to Town Hall, south Main Street to King Street, out to Rodney Hunt Mills, and to West Main Street to the Orange Innovation Center, and uh, East River Street to Butterfield Park, West River Street to Rose Island. Just to put it in context of where you are, one of the things that we know is that when you have such access to Route 2, we have access to the airport, um, you're two right there, North Main Street, South Main Street, half off, and the people, the Orange Municipal, Municipal Airport, which is a big asset at the, the community that um, You know, we said last time, and I say again, there's got to be this feeling in the town of, oh my gosh, not another study. There's so many of these that have been done, and these are just a sample of some of them that have been done. I'll just, um, point out the, the fact that you are not alone in having this kind of complete <laughs> about not another study. I mean, there's every community you've worked in, every single one of them, take, takes a decade and a minimum to kind of gather their thoughts, to marshal it, to accept the problem, to move on from where they were to a, a plan. So this master plan fatigue that, that, you're, that many of you might be experiencing, every community experiences, these are just some of the communities we've worked in, New Bridgeport, um, Sandwich, Mass, um, uh, Cochico Waterfront, and Dover. And collectively, on this one up here on the left, I point out that the first master plan that was done for New Bridgeport was done in July of 1972. And they still haven't done anything to the waterfront. So all that all that's just meant to make you feel better about the fact that it's taken a while to get to a coherent vision for what um, might be coming. So the process, what have we been doing? So obviously something led up to this final presentation. For those of you who weren't at the last one, I'll just go through it. We've, done, we've been on the ground here since March. And in, um, in a series of steps, we met with, with key stakeholders. And that doesn't suggest that some people are more important than, than others, just that there are property owners that, that are very critical to anything that would happen on the downtown riverfront and we met with all of them to understand what their considerations were. We had preliminary discussions um, with, with those folks, and we uh, essentially dove deep into the weeds of data and, and uh, from past studies that, you, that have been commissioned from various sources and have taken various approaches to what the problem and what the solution of the orange is. And a lot of our work is collating that and reaffirming all of that. So, I'm not going to go through these, there's no need to, but almost every idea that we, we will be presenting tonight has been present in these studies before. We said before when we came here that we were essentially going to collate and prioritize 
probably good ideas that have come before us. I think we've added a couple of new ones, but primarily we're trying to lead through and help you uh, figure out a manageable next step. So these are just some of the ecotourism and the more investment and the sustainable design assessment community needs. And then all the ones that Kevin Kennedy has done. So that gives you a sense of the effort and the thought and the commitment from a lot of people that have gone into Orange. In April, we met with these uh, with local business owners and town officials. Um, uh, Gary Moyes, Sean Ashcroft, Paul Anderson, Brianna Drawing, Bill Gooden, um, and then a number of town representatives to talk about what they saw as the impediments and incentives for them to, to work. Um, so out of this came some major themes, which I'm sure those of you who have been to these sort of things have heard this before, but beautification, downtown orange needs to be attracted to destination residents and visitors, revitalization, diversification. There are numbers of identities and strengths to build on that I think everybody who lives in Orange and has followed this at all is starting to recognize them. We um, basically confirmed those. We saw that we've all recognized these already. We've got the success of the Orange Innovation Center. We've got the, the um, recreation, and I'll call it probably too strong a word, but the industry that's coming along with recreation, which I think is a huge success for the town. The municipal airport, which I believe is relatively untapped as an asset. The antiques district, the events calendar, and you're starting to get quite a year-round list of events that are, that are um, great. And local, a local artist population that are obviously willing and able to contribute to the overall health of the community. So we talked last time about these there's two levels of fixes. One of which, you can't assume that you're going to go from zero to 60 in one second. A lot of these, the kind of things that I'm going to talk about later, fall into the category of these short-term fixes, where you try out an idea with something that's impermanent to see if it has legs. And then if it does have legs, you build the permanent version of it later. Um, and we call that, in the, the jargon right now, is tactical urbanism, where you, you use paint and astroturf and and temporary pavilions to create an urban place and see if that has appeal. If it does, it becomes the justification for something more intensive. But that's mirrored by the long-term planned expense of infrastructure. And I think ultimately, it's that kind of seesaw between the long-term infrastructure and the short-term idea that doesn't wait for a big grant or a construction budget to, to make something happen. And I'll show some examples of that. And then I said, just as by way of a pep talk for everybody in, in Orange last time I was here, that you've got to believe that this is not just blowing smoke. A lot of communities have dealt with this, and a lot of them have been successful. And I pointed out in my own hometown, it's Providence, Rhode Island, which looked like this in 1981. It looks like this now. <coughs> this looked like this in 1981. and looks like this now. Looked like that in 1981. and looks like that now. And so on, and so on. And the reason I showed that was to, to suggest that Providence in 1981, sort of writ larger, was is orange in 2015. Sort of, the, the, your major industries have left, it's left a big vacancy, you're struggling for a new identity, for a new physical realm, and, and Providence was that. Nobody, nobody who knew Providence in those days thought anything was possible. And a series of, of creative funding endeavors and, and intelligent, uh, politicians and committed individuals made this happen. And Providence now is recognized as, I think, every year it wins for the most livable city award in New England or something like that from various magazines like GQ and, and Vogue and I don't know how they come up with that. But anyway. Just a couple more images of what, this is the next phase that's coming on the heels of all of that. This is how the Kennedy Plaza looks right now, which is the main sort of civic plaza for the city, and this is our plan for its future. And this is beginning to be implemented. And, and one of the themes of tonight is that success begets success. And once problems start to turn, people start to believe and money flows in that, that direction. So again, another image of what the, our, our downtown has been turned into a glorified bus control over the last 25 years, and we're beginning to reverse that, and now it's starting to look like this. The buses are out of that area. And, and you're really turning it around. So I use that as a, as a um, way to encourage you. Um, but also to say, another case to make here is that it's not all physical design. And 
one of the big things about the health problems, especially carrying the positive event, is the idea of programming and events and cultural events. A lot of times people want an architect or an urban designer to come in and say, design us a beautiful plaza and then everything's going to be great. But it never works that way. What happens first is that you get all of these different groups that come together and start planning events. And that's what Orange is already starting to do. I see that um, you know, there are a number of things that you get online and just type in Orange, Massachusetts, and you get the, the River Rat Base and the, um, all sorts of events that are happening during, during the year. And I think those are really important towards um, uh, cultivating a sense of what's possible. Ultimately, it's the people that will get other people to come to Orange. So you've got to get the people here by whatever way you can. Um, one other point I'd like to make with this is just that a lot of this rejuvenation of downtown Providence happened not with construction dollars, but with arts funding. This is the um, National Endowment for the Arts, which gave a number of grants to different groups in, in downtown Providence to build temporary facilities for story time for the kids, for show you some of these images. They, they paid for an event that we had that got 60,000 people into downtown Providence to watch this international arts fair. And these are the folks all sitting there looking at these people dancing down the side of So this is just recap, but these, this is the point I wanted to make about all of that. that. Those are all the organizations that help with downtown Providence. And if you think Kevin Kennedy is going to be able to do this, or any a selectman or a group of selectmen, they're not. It's going to take everybody, every different entity and group pulling together to make something like that. So what we heard at the last meeting after we presented that, we presented that sort of intro, and then we had a free range of discussion um, of just to reconfirm a lot of the things we had already heard. We heard that um, folks felt the need to understand the, stuff, the funding sources and the process for obtaining them. So one of the things we will have in our final report is a compendium of all the different funding sources that could be accessed to, to actually make happen a lot of the recommendations that we're, we, we've got um, to make in a few minutes. Find ways to build upon and improve the waterfront resources. I think that was, that's obvious, especially on a night like tonight. You can see where your asset is, and that's where you're going to put your efforts. You need to find additional volunteers to help maintain and improve the existing resources. Everyone can play a part in the bottom-up effort. And there's already actually quite a, a, an organized um, universe of volunteer groups in the Fawbin Valley. And I think that Orange needs to focus in particular on um, focusing, organizing, and having a single point of uh, contact for those groups that are here. Build on the momentum of recent efforts, including beautification of the, of the park across the way and the river, and find ways and incentives to attract new businesses both large and small. The boathouse is an example of something that's thriving and brought a great deal of quality of life for the town. The Orange Innovation Center is something that people always mention when we talk about success in Orange. And find ways and incentives to get the current owners to reinvest. That's something we've got a specific recommendation on how we can do that. So what we said we were doing moving forward when we left this meeting last time, we said we would consolidate and prioritize previous studies we would add our new ideas, and we, I said sort of um, not pessimistically, but maybe not optimistically enough, that we wouldn't have too many more ideas because everybody already had good ideas. I think we've had some, and we'll add those to them. And we would present the most important ideas with the first steps for people to actually do something. Because one of the, and you know this, one of the phenomenons of these sort of uh, community studies is you get all excited, you come to this final presentation, there's some great images shown, you leave, and there's just this dissipation of energy, and nothing happens. And it's because it's so overwhelming, nobody knows where to start. But we're going to leave you with a number of first steps. We're going to talk about them generally tonight, they will be listed specifically in the final report. So the challenge that, that Orange faces, this is where we sort of dive deep. Downtown Orange, like every community, is an ecosystem which is to say that all these interrelated factors, and only part of it is design, some of it's the market economy, some of it's the demographics of the community, everything adds into it. But it all boils down to the current equation that's holding Orange down is that the market conditions don't exist to improve. It's just a simple matter. There's not, you can't get enough rent to pay 
for the, the rejuvenation of your building, you certainly can't get enough rent to pay for a new building. And so every developer who can develop it or not, they just they work by the rules of math. They come in, they look at the equation, say it's a nice place, but I can't get the rents I need to, to do anything. So it sits. And anybody, local business owner who owns a building, says, you know, at this moment in time, I couldn't get my money back, so I'll just wait until the market changes. And they do. They wait, and they wait, and they wait. So you get rents that don't support it, the vacancy rate is high, current owners, some of which are absentee, aren't investing in general in Orange, they're waiting for the market to change. And because of that, the current physical setting, not all of it, but a large part of it is undesirable for potential retailers who don't have an emotional tie to Orange to begin, begin to. It's, it's like this, you've got this vicious cycle. <clears throat> you've got an undesirable physical setting, which results in a lack of a sense of place. Business owners, so they have to hire people, or they have to create a retail operation that's going to attract people. To do that, they want a sense of place, a sense that there's some reason for people to come to Orange. Well, in the current setting, we don't have that except in, in isolated pockets. So that creates limited activity and limited spending, which reduces high vacancy, and that produces low rents when the market's not demanding it. And that, that creates lack of new investment. And that continues in a downward spiral in every lot of communities that experience it. The opposite is also true. The virtuous cycle starts with an improved physical setting. Now you get a sense of place, and people start to notice that. And I would say that a night like tonight, with the boathouse and the, the river, you feel the potential of a sense of place here. It's not quite there, but it's there in moments around events, but it's not, nobody yet is coming because someone says downtown Orange is absolutely beautiful. But they could. So if you're generating a sense of place, that's increasing the activity, increasing the spending, not from people because they're, they're philanthropic, but because they see a financial opportunity. You know, people are coming to Orange, maybe we should open a cat hall, maybe we should open a restaurant. And that starts to reduce the vacancy rent, which raises vacancy rate, which raises the rents and creates an influx of new investment. So I won't make any bones about it. Reversing the vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle is an incredibly difficult task. And if it were easy, a lot of places would have done it. Providence, it took them 50 years before we started going in the other, other direction. But that's the basic conundrum that Orange faces. Um, so why is that? And I'm going to point out some of the physical flaws in Orange right now that I think could be addressed to change that sense of place. Many of the problems stem from a lack of a strong sense of place. One of them is this idea of the missing key. And all that really says is that even if those black blocks are all buildings, you notice that they don't line up into any order that creates a clear street. So automatically you see all these places where you'd like to put a building, where there isn't a building. And the result is now you start to see the street defined, and you sit all the buildings at every corner. And, and why is that important? Well, it's important because pedestrians in a sense of place demand a sense that you're in a place that's crowded, that has borders on the edge of every good retail place that I know of in the world, has stores on both sides of the street, the corners are strong, all the best buildings on the corners, and people not only like to shop there, they like to walk there. So this is a big deal for creating a sense of place. There's an unclear sense of arrival in Orange. I mean, is it there that, that you arrive in downtown Orange? Or is it here when you cross the bridge and you're at Memorial Park? Or is it here when you're just about to cross the bridge? Where, where's the point? And I would say, if you think of it in those terms, as you drive into Orange, especially as a stranger, you realize, I don't know when I've got it. <laughs> and I'm there, and I just go through it? Where is it? So that's symptomatic of, of a real problem, because the best places, the places where people want to be, you know when you've got it. You know when you're in the center, and you want to be there. And if you, not at the center yet, you want to get to the center because that's where the action is. Think of Trinity um, Square in, in, in uh, Boston, in front of the Boston Public Library, and Trinity Church. That's a place you know you're right in the living room like that day when you're there. And I would say that uh, Orange is lacking. So there's a lack of center, that look of fo focus that I was just talking about. Um, this is a, the inverse of that last slide where I took all the buildings and I made black blocks out of them. In this slide, I took everything that wasn't a building and made black out of that. And I 
you know, find a place and find something that feels like, like you say, center. It's, it's just, it's a bunch of um, Legos scattered on the ground. And, and I just contrast that with something like this. This is the map of Rome. I don't need to get too much comparing to Rome, but, but there's, in this case, all of the, the space that's building is white, and the places that are left over, the public spaces, are black. You can see immediately that it's a series of connected places. It's not this uh, kind of wide open space with no definition. Everything is formed into a public place. And contrast that with downtown uh, Orange. And I'm only saying that because it matters. It's not because it's an, like, this is an architect's, you know, trying to lecture you on architecture. I'm saying that the kinds of places people want to be have this sense of definition and closure. <coughs> The streets are too wide. That's another thing. If pedestrians can't get back and forth across them because it's dangerous or because they're just too wide, they don't want to be there. Um, and the sidewalks are too narrow in many places. There's no opportunity for the stores, whatever stores there are, to spill out onto the sidewalk. So these are a bunch of physical, physical characteristics that I think are holding um, orange back. And the good news is those are the ones that are most easily changed. But what's going right with, with orange? And the, the exceptions to those things that are going wrong sort of proves the rule. We've got the little moments where people have put out flower boxes and a kiosk, and that little moment suddenly says, okay, hey, somebody cares about this. They don't have, notice how those flower boxes make the corner. A lot of about making a pleasant place to be in is marking the edges so you don't feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. You've got the, the, uh, the waterfront park, which is a huge success. Little moments of celebration of the Fireman's Memorial and the Memorial of the Park. So these these are examples of what's uh, of place making that clearly work. On, on my asset, what's the thing that Orange has really got going for it? Obviously, the riverfront is the thing that you have that we should be working on. Um, every great view that I've seen of, of Orange, downtown Orange, incorporates this river. So why aren't there more places which address this room. I just want to point out this. See this slide on the, on the lower right? One of the things these build buildings do, especially at the bridge, is they create this sense of a place, an outdoor room, simply because the walls of the mills look closer. You have a vista down the river on either side, you have these mills facing you. But the other thing I want to point out is that that's the back of all those buildings. So, you, so the biggest asset is the thing that's being ignored the most, so I'll have them have to play a little bit more later, but I just wanted to point out that that's sitting there waiting to be dealt with. Um, the riverfront has been the generator of whatever successes you've had here. I don't need to say that as a blanket statement. Um, not every business in the, in the Orange Innovation Center has to do with the river, but what I mean is that the primary identity that you're trending towards right now is about the, the river itself. So these places, that slide's sort of dark. So that's the place you've got that from a purely design point of view has the most definition, most enclosure, most character, and the most potential. So the solution to this involves um, at least eight areas of focus, but they're all centered on one overall, overall goal, and that's to create a strong sense of place. And the reason why I'm focusing on the sense of place is because I believe, remember that virtuous and, and, and uh, vicious cycle, that the, the only way to change that market equation of low rents and lack of investment, and lower rents and lack of investment, is to work on the primary reason why someone would want to locate the And that's going to be, at least for the foreseeable future, the sense of place that you can conjure around the, around the river. So, I believe it's, it's not just kind of aesthetics to say that the sense of place is what you should be striving for. I believe that's your economic move here for downtown energy. Focus on the aesthetics because that's what's going to create the, the market potential. So to make that sense of place, we have issues of beautification, complete streets and improved connections. That means making sure sidewalks connect, making sure that streets are, are clear and well paved. Um, revitalization and renovation, incubating and creating diversity, funding sources and volunteer efforts, um, community development and marketing, the brand of Orange is very important, programming and event planning. Um, and so now we go through some of those things. And for each of these categories, we'll have a bunch of bullets that suggest 
things to do, and I'm only going to focus on one or two of them because it would be here all night if we went through all of them. But the sense of place, what we really want to do there is focus town activities and events in the core areas. And as an example, um, we'll show that you have a farmer's market in town. It's currently not happening downtown. It should be happening downtown. Whatever you have to do to get that downtown, it should be done. We'll show you a location where we think that could happen. Um, <clears throat> On beautification, um, we're suggesting that there are short-term um, improvements that should be due right now that will set the stage for more permanent improvements, like storefront improvements, street furniture and planters, parklets. Parklets are, are a phenomenon that, um, where for a temporary amount of time or permanent, if you just come in here to parking space off the sidewalk and make a little park out. And I was in a, a, a in the Azores about three months ago, and they have very narrow sidewalks. And what the restaurants have done to, to be able to have outdoor cafe seating is the parking space directly from the across the front door, they just built a little deck on it and then put shaped tables out there. I'm not sure if it was legal or not, but they did it and that could transform a street that otherwise couldn't have had any light on it. So this idea of temporary parks or temporary outdoor spaces um, and use art projects when you utilize the space as some of these recognitions are general, and we'll leave a specific raise in the report, how to move forward. Complete streets and improved connections. Um, this diagram right here is actually a vignette of part of, uh, of Main Street right there, and we're, we're just want to point out what we're talking about. Um, where you have huge expanses of, of pavement where somebody wouldn't dare to tread, you can create Right now, the sidewalk follows this line all the way to here and goes straight across to there. These are called bulbouts, and they're little, um, they pinch down the, the, the width of the street and create a shorter distance for pedestrians to travel. And this has been done all over the place. So there's been a lot of a huge um, movement towards complete streets, which means that the streets are built for pedestrians as well as for cars. And so there's a whole range of specific proposals um, that can be temporary, can be kind of tanked where they can be done with millions of money, millions of dollars of DOT money, depending on how lucky you get. Revitalization and renovation. <clears throat> to help close economic gaps, consider tax credits and or tax stabilization programs for priority sites. That's a little esoteric, but I'll explain what that means. Is that, again, there's this, there's a physical world that you're trying to create, and there's this nut that has to be cracked about the cost of doing it. Many communities have used these programs, which I'm not going to explain in great detail, about tax credits and tax stabilization to create an environment that's predictable for a developer. So when he puts in money to, to develop his building, he doesn't have to pay tax on that until that building starts to realize a, a capital return for him. It's a way of saying to the developer, we're going to partner with you, we're going to help you. We're not going to be sitting there waiting to tax you as soon as you you pay your contract and he leaves. Um, create roadmaps for key sites that outline steps and streamline processes. This is one that Eric came up with. And that's the idea that you, you go to the individual buildings that are key in downtown Orange to create a revitalization. And rather than hoping and waiting for the owner of that building to develop a program and come to the town with an idea of how they're going to do that, you do the math for them. You hire a consultant like Eric to write a development pro forma that says, here's what you have to do. If you put in $100,000 in this and you get this tax stabilization, you're going to create a return of 5% of your money. And I've worked it all out for you. How do you say you do it? And that's well within the community like Orange to do, which is to sort of pre digest the development opportunity. So the development community, let me just give you an example of how that works. There are developers all over central and northern Massachusetts, and they're all scrambling to find opportunities. Like anybody, they go to the path of least resistance. If they see a, a, a site that's ready to build on, they can do the numbers and know what the, the money's going to cost them, what the tax is. They say, okay, I run their pro forma, that works, I'll build there. When they come into Orange, they look at downtown Orange, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what the value of the building is, they don't know what their tax situation is going to be, they don't know how much it's going to cost to renovate it, they don't know any of these things. And they say, even though they might be in love with downtown Orange, 
they walk away because they don't have time to figure it out. Well, what we're saying is, let's figure it out for them. Have that at the city hall that says, okay, we've already figured out this for format. This building is ready to develop, and we can we can project and make this return on the money. So that's that one. <clears throat> Another thought was to also in the way of taking away the barriers to individual development opportunities is to have more targeted meetings with the key building owners in, in town and figure out what their impediments are. Why are they not moving? That's something that can be done tomorrow. Kevin Kennedy can set up those meetings. We could report that. We could find out what their issues are and be able to work on them. Create an incubating, create an incubating diversity. Work with the existing owners to create code-compliant white box spaces paired with low rent, short-term revenue-based leases. That's a lot of jargon. What it means is, let's say, <clears throat> um, building county corner across the up the river right there is just too big a project for anyone to imagine renovating and bringing the whole thing up to code compliance. There's an interim measure where you might talk to the, the owner about, could you just renovate? 750 square feet on the corner and put one door out on the side. Now, all you have to do is make that little, and it's called a white box. You're not designing it for anybody in particular, you're just making space that's usable. And there's a, um, in Providence, we've done that with my actually, my landlord and my friend and client has done that successfully in downtown Providence where he just fits out these, these spaces and they're ready for anyone. For, there's a term called pop up retail. If somebody wanted to come in for the Halloween season and set up a store that would be there for three months and then go, they've got a space to do it. If a, if a gallery wants to come in and set up for, for an event, they've got a space to do it. So encouraging and assisting these building owners who are busy and they're ready and say, this is how you do it, and we'll figure it all out for you. Just build out this one space and then take on tenants and and sort of incubate them. You're not expecting to get enough revenue to cover your whole building, but then again, you're getting no revenue now. You're getting zero. So with this, you're getting something. It's a way of starting a little momentum. <clears throat> um, funding sources and volunteer efforts. We want to create an ongoing database of applicable funding sources with a reference, reference to previous successes and failures. What that means is that um, between Jessica and, and uh, Beth and Kevin, we've assembled a list of all of these funding sources, and they range from arts grants to uh, state DOT funding to federal funds to MassWorks, which is a, a state um, program that, that fosters uh, economic development in communities. And Having that all in one place, so that any idea that comes to any particular group, they can go access that and say, this might look to be a potential avenue, is a, a very important thing. So I recognize, just repeat for a second, a lot of these recommendations are not sexy, and they're not design-based. They're kind of process-based and, and building up an infrastructure, but they're important. Um, community development and marketing, that's huge. Um, emphasize to, in the story that Orange tells about itself, what we're saying is that there should be a particular story built around that we're working on the whole thing. We're, we're moving somewhere in Orange, and I'll give you the framework for that in a minute. But the idea is that we want to create a larger vision that so that somebody doesn't, you can't, it's hard to get inspired by that previous comment about a white box space. That's not a heroic vision that people are going to march in the streets about. It's necessary. But what you need to do is put it in the context of a much larger vision so people see that orange is going, orange is downtown kind of problem. They're, they're on the upswing. Um, and um, and then this idea that, that the, the town website could be the hub for bringing together all the well-meaning people who want to contribute to that. That's a, a, a big effort that needs to be done. <clears throat> Programming and event planning. Um, the idea here, or one of the ideas, is to focus on activities at the core and include emphasis on the existing businesses and temporary uses to better support the local, business, uh, local economy. And that's to say, we don't we, we try to direct all development into the core and not build a new building half a mile down the street. If there's any way to get that business downtown, 
this is just a, 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 a quick little sketch of the um, farmer's market being re relocated to the corner of Main and Main um, right there. The idea that that empty lot right now is not being utilized as an empty space, it's worse than not contributing, it's detracting. And setting up regular farmer's markets and that gives a certain life that spills over into all those adjoining businesses, even if it's only once a week. <clears throat> so that brings me to the framework. What we, our intent in this presentation was to say, there are all these individual areas that you need to work on, and we're going to give you a way to work on those things. But I contend, and I said, I think alluded to it a minute ago, that those don't really have the power to inspire by themselves. They inspire when you think of them as all coming together to create something that you didn't imagine. And so that's what we're doing on the grand vision. The benefits of the grand vision, and I'll explain this plan in a minute, is that it provides a shared goal and a, and a common lens that focuses everybody around. Individual efforts are not in a silo or getting off track from the grand vision. The vision outlasts the political cycle. Who's ever in charge right now may not be in charge a year from now. And having a, a, a vision that people resonate, resonates with people that they can remember sort of keeps everybody on the same track. It becomes very practically the basis for grants. People who give money to Town of Orange don't want to give it to someone who doesn't have a big idea. If you, if you want money to just repair a corner of your streetscape, you're not going to get it. If you want money as part of a whole vision of improving your downtown streetscape that makes it more pedestrian friendly and more sustainable, you get a lot of people that are interested. In fact, a lot of, a lot of grant organizations that give grants won't give it until the community has demonstrated a certain amount of momentum on their own. So having a plan like this in place in a very real sense becomes a document that Kevin can use in his applications for, for hard money to do things. Uh, it becomes a, a way to focus the community efforts and town improvements, because you can always refer back to something like this, which I'll explain in a minute, as, okay, well, that's that's where I should go. If the choice is between site A, B, or C, I now know, know that we're saying the priority is whichever of those sites is in the town. And it creates a new market to boost economic investment that wouldn't happen otherwise. And this is part of, just like grant writers, or grant um, grantors don't like to give money to something that doesn't look like it's going anywhere, nor do investment, investors and developers. But if they see that this is a plan, it's a real plan, and the community keeps referring back to it as, a, as its 15-year plan, now the developer's thinking differently. They say, I want to get in on the beginning of that and ride the value up. So that's why it's important, even if this looks heroic, and you know, some of the, the, the thoughts of it are heroic, it's important to have this thing to say to people, this is where we're going and where we need to go. So in some of the details of it, <clears throat> as I said, the intersection of main and main, we're showing um, tabs that show this uh, A new plaza at the corner of um, main and main, Temperance Fountain. Right now, that's just asphalt. Now, that's an opportunity to do that in a permanent way to become paved with raised curves. In a temporary way, it could even be a wooden deck that fills in that area and becomes a setting for some sort of event, whether it be an extension of the farmer's market or some other thing. <clears throat> Streetscape improvements, including what, what I just referred to as the bulldogs, crosswalks, ramps, etc. All of that. The, right now, the streetscape looks fairly inconsistent and ratty in places, and having a, a sustained investment in a consistent uh, pedestrian environment is huge to create that kind of space. Infill site, put a new mixed use building where you have the opportunity to do it, which will also benefit from the farmer's market. The temporary use is the farmer's market is there. Landscape screening at the exposed edges. Remember, I said that, that urban has been creating a nice place for people to be, is about marking the edges. And the dividing things. Every good urban space lets you know when you're in one place or another, and every bad urban place is where you just don't know. Am I on the sidewalk or am I not? So using plantings to screen the parking and create um, closure for that is important. Possibly a new site. If, if the town were considering, for instance, a new library, which I have heard that, that there's been talk about, um, at some point in the near future, trying to make an effort towards establishing a new library. That would be a location. If you were to say, I 
we have a location, it's, on, it's out by Route 2, and more people can get to it. I said, great, go ahead and do that. You're not helping you downtown. Whereas bringing a civic structure like that in the life that, that brings into downtown, even if for some reason it's incrementally more expensive to do so, is, is what we should be doing. So we're identifying those locations and saying, use every opportunity that you have at your disposal, including infrastructure improvements that you already have in, on the way, like um, transportation money or, or sewer uh, upgrades or things like that, leverage those into streetscape improvements. <clears throat> In the area of Memorial Park, they're including, they're saying, to continue those streetscape improvements of adding defined parking spaces, widening the sidewalks, adding the bulb outs and ramps, et cetera. This is one idea. Right now, if you look out that door, in this area, and we go back to the, uh, the existing area, the most valuable asset you have in town is this river, in my estimation. And you've got an access road going right by here with a high curve and then a the metal railing between you and the water. And the park that you need to get up to the edge of the water. It strikes us that just when you look at the circulation, and I apologize for if the light safety folks or the fire department in front of you, we don't need to unilaterally take away your access. We're suggesting that there might be other access ways to access the trucks moving in and out, and that making this leftover asphalt into a public space, which would be um, a complement to the contemplative quality of, of, of the Memorial Park, which with its, as a Memorial Park, is probably not the best place to have a reggae band. But this space right here and this space right here might be absolutely appropriate to have some sort of um, event space. So adding that green, getting out to the water's edge, <clears throat> um, close that street the water, um, water street access and make that an extension of the park. The river walk, a river walk should be added to the backs of these buildings. These are the mill buildings that are currently there. And I'm going to show you an image that's more or less clear. But we're suggesting that if you added a structure cantilever ramp or even a ramp on piers if we, could, if we could do that and created an occupiable space that you could walk around that would be a huge boom and I'll show you some images to prove that. Um, that high sort of imposing curve in front of the parking there with this metal rail we're proposing to take that away for a section to create a place where you can get right down to the water's edge um, so it's replaced with steps and pavilions. The old fire station that we're standing in right now, we have reason to believe that the fire station is sort of moving, gradually moving out of this, it doesn't occupy the trucks anymore, and that there's reason to think that in the not too distant future, this building might become available for other uses when the fire department modernizes into a new building. It's conjecture on our part. I don't need to assume anything or to, to push anything. I'm just saying, as we look at this, we think, well, there's a, probably a higher and better use for this building than as a fire department. And it would be awesome if it were a cafe or a boot hub or some sort of place that were a destination for people to come and be right beside the water. <clears throat> Likewise, the, the fire department has already got a temporary building right behind us that they're using for tours. So that, that could become the location of the new fire department. And in designing that, you can help create the enclosure for the park and not diminish the access of the fire station to severe And extend the, the trails along the river's edge. <clears throat> Looking a little further down across the river, um, again, the shoulders on the, oh, the bridge right now, for the for all the work that's been done on that bridge, the actual pedestrian ways across are kind of new. They've got these sort of bulkheads on the, on the traffic side. They're relatively narrow. We think that's an opportunity, just like building off the backs of the mill buildings, to create more access and presence to the river, to extend those great shoulders that people could actually not just move across, but, but occupy it for a period of time. Trails along the river's edge, gateway signage, letting you know when you've actually entered downtown, streetscape improvements. Creating, using this location right here, 
for some large into a building, something that might bring people actually living downtown with senior housing or, or a mix of use on the ground floor, um, adding the bike lane, ex expanding on the success of the, of the um, waterfront, the riverfront park by completing, I believe there was a second phase of the docks that was never completed. In any case, that's such a successful moment that that should be good. Um, another infill site and another chance to create a moment on the river would be right in that little gap between this building and uh, I forget what that is. Um, but if there's an opportunity there for an infill building that might be a small restaurant or cafe that spills out onto that newly constructed deck that's over the river. <clears throat> and in three dimensions, this is sort of what that might look like. These are those little, what I'm calling the river walk, esplanade, the idea that the roof of this building might become a cafe. This is the steps coming down to the river with a location from with the turn, architectural turn of the bell right here, where you can go the edge and look over. The expanded um, Memorial Park, expanded Riverfront Park, you know, Main and Main, uh, the Farmer's Market, the new buildings located behind the existing fire station and where the library might go. Um, embedded in this image of a whole bunch of ideas. I'll just show you what some of those look like. <clears throat> so if this is that area right now, and this is not, believe me, I don't think this is terrible by any means, but I think that having a road separating grass from where the pedestrian from that edge is unfortunate, especially when that's the place where you want to go. So if that looks something more like that, all the way along that edge, you're taking, you're making that be a signature image. Now, every piece of marketing that Orange does regionally includes that image. And maybe it, it goes out a little bit, you've got the fires in the middle of the river, and you've got some kayakers down there. But you're creating, you're building on this river, saying, that's our asset. Let's get to it. Let's create a place around that. And you're creating a place that people want to walk to. That. The fire has such a beautiful building that it deserves to be a uh, public function where people can enjoy it. Again, I'm very hesitant to say anything that's going to back the fire department into a corner. Um, so, I guess I said that. This is looking back towards the corner of uh, Main and Main, and what it might look like uh, when you narrow the streets down, added the plaza over here with, with trees that create a little grow in the farmer's market on the right, and start to define all those edges so that. Um, it's more about pedestrian and less about this sort of expanse of, of pavement and lack of edges. So see again, watch right in this area, take that leftover space and fill in with the bus shelter and, and trees and um, this is just a quick sketch of what it might look. Like if you took away this and we're looking across at the, at the Riverwalk um, extensions that are coming off the back of the buildings now. We've taken that down. We've opened up the side of this building with canopies and it's opening out onto a, onto a terrace with umbrellas and, and all of that connects down to the riverfront part and it can cross the street and connect down in the other direction. And that might be a good time to show that um, in the book here. We didn't know about this beforehand, but in the other direction, a precinct that's going to be sort of an um, outdoor recreation area with a um, bicycle trail slash cross country trail and a, a river walk with art pieces beside it. And so imagine now that this trail, I mean, you know it's hard to see from where you are, this trail is continuing up towards the center, towards the bridge here, coming up over the river walk, bridges coming across and down to. Now you get people, just imagine. You might in a place, you could definitely imagine now that you're getting people who are driving through the area who have heard about Orange and all the good things going on, and they come in for the day. And they decide once they're here, I'm going to take a walk along this new river walk I've heard so much about, and I'm walking here, I'm going to buy a coffee, maybe I'm going to buy a t shirt, maybe I'm going to rent a kayak. And that's a tiny thing, but that will start to build on itself. And you just have to give them something to. to um, and this is a way of example of what those could be. This is exactly the condition you have in Orange. These buildings right here in Milwaukee were the backs of mill buildings facing, 
facing the river. They did exactly what we proposed, which is built a cantilever deck off the back side, and in a matter of years, all of those buildings turned their fronts to this new waterfront community. And that's what I'm suggesting. These are other examples of river walks. That's um, Chicago, uh, that's downtown Providence right there. Which once we did that, one of the key things in relocating the river, which I didn't point out earlier, is letting people get down to the edge of the river. People, when they're near water, want to get to the water. We don't like being removed from it. It's, it's just sort of universal. So that's one of the reasons we presented those broad steps down to the water's edge. Um, this is San Antonio. <clears throat> I wasn't here before, I, I wasn't there before the river walk was in place, but I've seen photos of it. And essentially, it was the, it was the back doors of all these buildings. It was a, a glorified sewage ditch. And now it is the, the kind of crown jewel of the southwest. People come from all over just to walk the river. So I offer that just, again, after being at altitude and suggesting all these grand visions for orange, there can be a skepticism that sets in. And you've got to fight that, because it's possible. It's absolutely possible. So here are the orange, my, my top 10, although I couldn't come in with the top 10, so it's actually the top 13. Um, these are the things that I think should happen in orange. Quickly. Focus the core. Focus town activities and events into the core area. Every time you have a chance for an event or, or anything, make it happen in the downtown area, even if at the current moment it's less convenient for yourself. Beautify. Using the short-term techniques that we described, I described a little bit and we described more fully in the report. Use short-term beautification to create storefronts, little parklets, pool areas, box planners that have moved around. Focus all of your efforts on little incremental attempts to beautify. Align. Align the priorities of the town departments with this focus on the core. And that's one of the biggest drivers you have, one of the biggest budgets you have is like your your Department of Public Works and, and the infrastructure that has to be maintained and built in town like this. So let's just say, for instance, which I, I think is true, that you have to have sewer upgrades in the downtown area. There's no reason why those sewer upgrades should only be sewer upgrades. If you're going to rip up the street, build back the other street. Fix the sewer, because that's what you, you have to do. But there's no reason you can't, while you're doing that, add curbing and expand the sidewalks. And so that you have to have coordinate. We have many towns, mine included. The DPW and the town engineer works on the side of it. He's got the agenda, needs to improve drainage and water flow and, and get the sewage drain. And for him, it might be an irritation to have to coordinate with the park department on how they do that. But that's what, as a community, you have to insist on. Because those are your opportunities. Every one of those times that someone has to put a shelf in the ground for something practical it should also be an opportunity for something helps make the place. Streets. Recognize that the streets themselves, even more so than the parks and the different squares, the streets themselves are the public realm. Sidewalks have to be in place, paving patterns need to be nice. It needs to be something that people want to walk on and not just get from one place to another. Um, Stabilize. To help close economic gaps, consider tax credits and or tax stabilization programs for priority sites. That touches on the more um, complicated thing I mentioned before about uh, fiscal approaches. Roadmaps, that idea of pre-designing or pre-developing a building for someone, so all they have to do is come in and write the check. Set it all up so it be easy for them. Understand, post more in-depth meetings with key stakeholders to understand why they're not doing anything with this property. White box, create those little moments. Remember that building I showed where I said we did the river walk and I said they had to place a cafe now fronting on the river? That's a moment where all you have to build is that corner, maybe 500 square feet, and you create an opportunity that doesn't require $10 million investment, it requires a $30,000 investment. Funding, create that database of applicable funding sources. Volunteers, you need to organize all of the energy. The last meeting I was here for another hour after the meeting with so many people who talked about all the things they wanted to do. And I feel like there's a huge energy in the so needs to be capitalized on. And vision. Emphasize the grand vision. Think of all these things in terms of a, of a, of a big new waterfront 
for, for orange, even if that feels unrealistic. That image, that perspective, gives power to all those little moves. And Hub set up a hub in terms of the, there being a point in maybe it's Kevin's office where all this stuff, the, the ongoing update is communicated back to the community, where you can check in to see what needs to be done and what's being done, what there needs to be communication. <clears throat> so the, the final thing is a point that I've, I've made several times now, that all of this, none of this comes from me or from Kevin Kennedy or from the select. It just doesn't. And so if anyone wants this to happen, it's a matter of figuring out which of those, those little projects I thought I presented, saying which of that, those ones appeals to me, and then moving forward, not waiting for someone to tell you how to do it. And we will do our best in the report to give you the next step on all, all of those things. But it requires somebody being irrational and unrealistic and wildly optimistic and refusing to say no, to hear no, for any of this to happen. And it won't happen until enough people do that. Um, so there's our vision and our next steps for, for Orange. Um, and I sincerely, sincerely hope that it moves in that direction.
fight, but it's even more than the place you park in the today. So, and going on too long about this, but parking is a much more of a perceived problem than a real one, and the solutions to it are the, the last thing you need to contemplate is building more parking spaces, it's management and making the best use of it. Yes. How do you get through the state and local environmental environmental regulations? I mean, with the Riverstone, Massachusetts. Well, first you walk out to the brick wall and you bang your head. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That's my point. No, I, I don't have an answer, but it's it's difficult. I will say that yeah, in our in our package of resources that we're going to be doing, we have all of the agencies, the funding agencies that go with that. I will say that one of the biggest factors in getting through those agencies is having a vision that adds up to something where other state agencies get vested. So if there's a big top-down political support for redoing the water, that pressure goes down on the, on the Department of Environmental Management too, to be more flexible if you want this to happen. But just it's simple politics. It, it, the only person you're talking to is the environmental folks who have no reason to do anything other than protect the river, they'll protect the river. If, if they feel like they have to make a compromise with other issues, you get a government that's involved and says, I want this to happen now. They're doing their job, but they're they kind of getting a little more flexible. So the short answer is, if anyone can figure out how to get things through state agencies easily, you're, you're a hero. Um, the longer answer is all of these things that contribute to getting into those. Yeah. I have a shorter answer to that question. Um, I'm the chairman of the Conservation Commission here in town, and nothing I have seen here is not doable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I did also have a question. Um, I was really interested in your um, your strategic uh, design yeah. and, um, and and setting this thing up for developers who are coming into existing buildings. How does one do that um, when you're trying to uh, create a building such as the one that's across from the Riverfront Park, across uh, East, East River Street? That large complex you have there, you're suggesting senior housing with ground oh. floor on the worst of uses. So, and, and the question is how do we do that? Or how do you set that up? How do you design? set that up? Well, I, I would say, to be totally frank, that's probably one of the last pieces that comes in after the other existing buildings so smaller opportunities have started to catch on. But that kind of development is going to require major equity, major financing. And I don't think you really what this has got to do is set the stage for very incremental development that starts to build up something like that. Okay, so the tactical issue there is that that's a piece of land for sale. <coughs> it would be great to grab it. We don't have money. Yeah. So, you know, it could be a writing that comes in there. That's yes, possible. it could be. You might, and I'm just spit on it. Let's say you've got a landowner right there who's, who's getting no revenue on that at all. One of the tactical urbanists you would say, listen, your land is sitting there and you're paying taxes on it, it's not getting paid. Why don't you set up a series of pop up stores, temporary <coughs> facilities right there that come in for the winter season to have a craft store? And now you're going to get $5,000 for the year to get that. And, and you show them how to do it. The point that I was making is that you get to the development, wait for that way to come in. A group of you get together, you figure out what his economics are, and then present him with an idea that he might think is interesting. And so he may not he may be holding out for the right aid, but the right aid wants to come. In the meantime, if you can show him by using shipping containers placed along that edge with with doors cut in and, and awnings that fold up and in the summer months those can cater to the river rat um, event or the you have created something where there was nothing. And one more anecdote. I was at a conference out in Utah where we were talking about these issues and they took these abandoned rail yards and with shipping containers, they created like a whole city. Temporary city, shipping containers on stage and coffee shops that were put into the, the open ends of shipping containers. And it was a, became this little provisional town for the four days we were in town. And it, it really showed what that place could be with some long term vision and investment. It's that kind of stuff that. 
I, mean, I also want to say, even if it does become a range, if you've got a larger vision that your board of approvals can stand behind, get the right in on the corner, get a door on the street, make sure that it follows the same rules and everything else that you're trying to do here. So even if it's sort of your worst case scenario, this might allow you to put enough pressure on them to try to do it the best way possible, so it's still supportive of the vision. Also, I wouldn't discount the possibility that a rate a right aid could actually be a generator. A lot of people come to a, a drugstore and getting those people in creates incidental opportunity for other retailers. It's just pain in the in the world of mall retail that follows the anchor heads. Everybody's coming to Macy's, so they have to walk by the orange Julius to get to the to the Macy's. And if everybody's coming into town for the right aid and you built that right aid correctly, that can be a boom. It doesn't have to be, and certainly don't let the right aid people tell you that we have a single model and this is what we build or we don't build anything at all, because that's never true. They will build it the right way if you need to. Sorry, I'm so worried. Yes. I would suggest, I would suggest that your plan for what you like to do on the river front. Have you heard of the Bridges Act in Massachusetts? It's the first state to hurt by much in other states. And so if you had a proposed project, for instance, on a lot of the benches or the river area, before you do anything, you contact the Bridges Act people and get their approval. All the white ways along on those outside of the buildings. Okay. Yes, I think that's absolutely true, and I would say that there are a lot more hurdles than just that to have to overcome. I mean, and anybody who really takes this effort has got to do it out of the way they love well because they're going to see a thousand defeats before they see success. But yeah, everybody's got their pressure. So uh, again, the uh, Conservation Commission administers the uh, Wetlands Protection Act, uh, of which the Rivers Act is now a part. And um, I, I'm also an environmental consultant. I don't see anything here that's not doable. Yeah.
Thank you again for coming. Uh, thanks for the fire department opening the fire station to us. And uh, we have one more. Is there, is there an accept? I, I am excited about this, but I always hate leaving a meeting when I don't have an extra step. And that is the only problem with this. If you get us all excited and it's not a next date or something happens, I don't care what happens together. And I think, is there a plan for the next time? whether the people that are interested want to bring other people in and we get started, but is there another time other than this? That's the well, question. Our report would be sort of a workbook of all the ideas, and in particular, we're offering the first step on each of the key 10 or 13 points that I put together. I, we are not coming back I understand for that. You are not coming back. Right. My question is really, what what is our next step? What is the next date? for townspeople together, I guess. Is there a date at this point? Or is this the, the end and we'll just see what happens? There's so many times when we get like this, yeah. it's kind of a downer because you all go home and then a year later you're yeah. saying what happens to that wonderful time. I understand. And you know, one thing I made very clear about when you used to came here for the first time is that we want a vision that we have to have practical we have to have things which will start to change things right off the bat. And what they are going to provide to us, they are some of those uh, temporary tactical urban, urbanism things you will start seeing around downtown. You'll start seeing changes as it happens. Um, we'll start implementing some of the, the steps that they provide right off the bat. And one of the major steps is we have to start applying to and, and begging the state for our fair share of investment that, it, that it's time for it to come on this side of Boston and into this area of probably the greatest need in the state. And it's time to get the dollars out here to start doing some of this construction group. Um, I am going to set up a site for us to be able to check up, check in on this, to be able to see how's it going, what, where, where are we at in the process. This isn't a plan that's going to be put on a shelf and forgotten. We're going to be constantly referencing it. One thing I requested from the studio is I want the, the craziest vision that they've created, which looks like this. And we're going to put it everywhere. We want people to know it. We want people on top of their mind. We want people to, at, the, at their fingertips to know this is where we're headed. This is where we're going. And as bad as it feels like today, tomorrow is going to be a better day. We're going to put it in our kiosks. We're going to put it all over downtown. We're going to put it up when people go to our website. They're going to see this. They're going to see where we're headed. And it's going to be on the forefront of everything that we discuss. And it's not going to be something that's just forgotten. Really. So will there be a regular forum? I guess that is my real question. I get that you're going to do a lot, hopefully. We all that. But is there going to be a regular forum where people like myself, who are residents here, they want to come and be a part of a certain set? I may want the 11th one, and that's the group I want to find out. Will there be regular forums where people like myself can go to, so we know it's going to happen on a certain date, a certain time? Is that going to be part of the plan as well? And I, I'm not speaking for, for Kevin, I do want to say from the experience that I, I, I said it maybe too strongly in, in the presentation, but there won't be a forum unless you push for it. Nothing will and I just firmly believe that one person in the um, city government can't make this happen. And what it's going to take is that, that somebody pushing, shaking the tree, saying, I want a follow-up on this, and, and downloading the report and saying, this particular project is my, my flag that I'm going to pick up and carry into battle, and I'm going to make sure that we have follow-up meetings on how we get that river, river edge done. So I, I don't mean to be too harsh about it, but it, it, you're right, this will just go sit on the, on the steps, on the shelves, unless somebody gets excited about it. And Kevin's saying that, that he's going to keep it in front of everybody's eyes, and I don't think he has the ability to advance any one of those things too far without somebody else adopting it. And, and one continual form is my offices. Anytime you want to talk about any of this, say, I really like this idea. I want to work on this idea. I have an idea. We can come in and we can talk about it. And we can 
we need to set up a committee, which um, I don't love to do because there seems like we have a lot of committees already. But to me, having working groups is a great thing. Uh, we've been putting together this, the uh, summer uh, solstice river fest for two years now, and that's not even a, it's, it's kind of a working group of people who get things done. And I really enjoy working with those kind of groups. And I love to put together a group for any one of these elements that you see in this uh, image. Well, a little bit of the start. Sort of weekend in September, if I can get six to eight people who walk close to that parking lot for four. Awesome. I need six to eight volunteers. I've already got the guys who donate the park pool. I just need help. All right. Let's so we're we're mul we're mulching the parking lot. We can park park. 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 No, no, that's not down by the river. So <laughs> yeah. before dinner by the river. It would be wonderful before yeah, dinner. Before so dinner by the river. The first step is we're going to be mulching the parking lot uh, on the corner of East Side and West on the Main Street. So I'll let you know where when and where that is. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen. And then some of you decide that's a great place, and then eventually they're going to say, you know what, mulch is probably not the best thing. Let's, let's raise some money and pay it. And then you pay it. So it, it happens in, in lifts. And starting is the key. And so. so thank you again. Thank you so much for people who have come out. I want to thank, especially. Uh, uh, Susanna Wicks for coming out, and then um, Tom Mitchell from Senator uh, Rose Rosenberg's office is here as well. Uh, so it's very nice to see the political support. We're going to be having these uh, images in front of you constantly. So uh, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for.